Welcome to the Catholic Midlife Podcast, where we address the challenges and the opportunities of midlife from a uniquely Catholic perspective. This is the time, my friends, for a deeper renewal of your Christian vocation. Come and enter into the freedom of Christ that allows you to be the person you were created to be, because there's an amazing, awesome, exciting next season of life waiting for you. Hello, and welcome to the Catholic Midlife Podcast. You are here with Karen and Curtis Herbert. Hello, everybody. We are excited to be with you in our season here on the disciplines. We have a listener comment from last week. The listener says, thank you so much for your podcast this week. It was just what I needed. And they were referring to the episode, pardon me, on serene acceptance. Oh, that's wonderful. So glad to hear that. Karen, we're talking about a series of disciplines of being a disciple. Why are we doing that? <laughs> Is there a reason? Am I reminding you or myself? Or I want you to remind our listeners. Okay. Okay. Well, I believe these disciplines are really about not just being a Christian disciple, but just about being a human being in the way that we were created and striving to be who we were made to be. And the disciplines we're talking about, they're not going to be unfamiliar to our listeners. They've definitely been addressed in the Christian tradition. And they've also been addressed in just studies of the human person and in psychology. And so there's a lot of ways to approach these disciplines. And I think we just wanted to take some time to dig in and study some different perspectives on how to live, say, with serene acceptance. We think that being fully human includes these kinds of natural virtues, which, of course, they're interpenetrated by all the supernatural virtues. And we don't get to hear about these kinds of excellence presented really in this format. And there is so much here, and it's such a exciting to bring these disciplines forward to you. So we are excited also to be with you today in this discipline, which is trusting the process. Oh boy, I've struggled with this one, Karen. I'm a second guesser. I'm a redoer. I'm a tweaker. You're an outcome-oriented person. Yeah, yeah, I'm outcome-oriented. And maybe that's what it comes down to. I've started to appreciate that really it's about the meta process. It's about the bigger process. Yeah, yeah. And it embraces, it includes trusting in God's providence, mm. trusting in God that we are in a process. Yeah, we're on the way. We're on a journey. Really, trusting the process is finding contentment, fulfillment, peace of mind right where you are and allowing the process to teach you what it is you're ready to learn. And it's connected to hope. As people, Christian people, we understand that we are underway. Mm -hmm. And there's this tension in what we are trying to become and what we're trying to, to be with God. And the tension in that part of that trusting the process is living with that tension and, and embracing it. And like you say, letting, letting the feedback be feedback. Yeah. So often I know we're looking ahead. We're looking to the future. We're waiting until something happens or until we get to the next place, or we're worried and anxious about what might happen in the future. And that's living in the future and not living in the present where we're meant to be. Trusting in the process. There's three dichotomies we want to talk about, Karen. And the first one is outcomes versus mastery. Outcome versus mastery. It takes a while, I think, to reflect on what it means to have a mastery approach or a mastery orientation. We can get really attached to our desired outcomes, and it can really affect our, our mood, our emotional life, and even our choices. And we want to just contrast that with what we call a mastery orientation, which is focusing less on the outcome and more on the process, on how things are moving forward currently. What's the present information and inspiration? 
what are the the nuances of the journey that I'm experiencing now? Yeah, after all, I mean, the outcome is the outcome. It is what it is. And life is complex. And for most outcomes, there's something beyond your control yes. that's going to influence that outcome. Yeah. And what's within your control, or at least within your influence, is the process, the process that you are using to get your outcome and focusing on the process and trusting in the process, trusting in God's providence yeah. is the way to get the best outcomes, which is what we really want. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I don't think that trusting the process has any opposition to making a plan or having a goal or desiring an outcome. But really, it's about holding all of that loosely and letting the process unfold in a natural way and being able to appreciate that, to respond to that, to be in the moment of the process and to hold all of that other stuff loosely. Holding the outcomes loosely. We want to have some idea of the outcome we're trying to get, of course. We have to be going somewhere. Have to be going somewhere. Yeah. We need to hold it somewhat loosely, though, so we can continue to adjust how we're responding. And by trusting the process, we start to have the resilience to quickly bounce back and get back on it and figure out, okay, what's next? What do I need now? And also to appreciate what's happening in the journey, even the setbacks and the failures and the obstacles, because those are really important for learning, for growth, for personal growth, for achieving mastery. Just want to give a quick example here. This is kind of a maybe a superficial example, but I knew this one woman and she worked with athletes and she had this athlete and and they were like, OK, my goal is I'm going to get my time in my marathon down to this amount. And she was hyper focused on meeting that goal of getting her time down. And the person who was working with her said, well, let's shift your focus from that outcome you want. And let's talk about what happens in the process that serves that outcome. And they talked about when you're running, what is your posture like? How are you holding yourself? What is the rhythm of your running steps? And what is your breathing like? And let's actually focus on mastering the pieces of what you're doing. And when you can do that, the outcomes will flow from there. But your focus is on what are the pieces that I can do and I can focus on that are eventually going to create mastery around this. So she had process goals. Yeah. That reminds me of stories about salesmen that are in a slump mm -hmm. and they get counseled. Focus on your process for your next client meeting. Focus on your own energy that you're bringing to the situation instead of the outcome. Yeah. Yeah. And I think when we do that, we start to be a lot more aware of the changes and influence we can have in the process that has a really big effect on the broader thing that we're working for. I also remember listening to a coach that would be brought in for professional hockey players that were in a slump, and he would help them think about the next game, and his emphasis was on who do you have to be? Who do you have to be this game? And it would be something about the matchup, like, well, I have to be really quick, or I have to have great vision of where the puck is. And those are process goals. Yeah. So then you're focusing on quickness or vision or whatever it is that you have to bring to the table to be who you want to be. What's the second dichotomy you want to talk about? Oh, yeah. Okay. I, I really like this one. This is, let's say something happens in life and it's not what you want. Okay. It's not the outcome you want or it's not a situation that you would have hoped for we can ask that question, why? 
why? And there's different ways we can ask that question. We can ask it looking for reasons or we can ask it looking for purpose. And the words reason and purpose can seem to be saying the same thing, but they're really different because asking why did this happen? What's the reason? It's usually about, I want to find out what caused this. I want to identify who's to blame that created this obstacle in my life. And it, it's a very kind of negative catabolic energy that it brings to the situation. You may start to be like, well, what did I do? You know, and you question your plan, you question your decisions, you question your whole direction, and you're looking for reasons. You're blaming somebody or perhaps blaming something you did or mm -hmm. blaming a circumstance. While there's some utility in that, really it's quite limited because it's kind of a close-ended question. Right. Once you find the so-called reason, then your inquiry ends. Now, contrast that with finding the purpose. Looking for purpose, right? This is about where is the learning and growth? Where is the purpose in this situation? What is the positive element that's going to move me forward that I can get from this situation. And sometimes we have to really be committed to finding it, to looking for it and finding it because it's not always self-evident. God's always drawing good out of any situation, regardless of whether we think it's, it's good or bad. And the purpose is, is there. There's, something we can bring out of this, something we learn or something we need to know or something that's just helpful. There's some kind of purpose to be found in the situation. The purpose is almost like, where's the call? Where's the call into something new? Who am I called to be? How am I called to transform? How am I called to influence others or make a difference in the situation, that's the purpose. And I do think sometimes we have an inaccurate perception of this issue. So we might say something like, oh yeah, God has a purpose. God sent me this situation for some reason and I'm supposed to learn something. I think we say that a lot. It's not entirely accurate, especially if the situation involves sin and failure and weakness and things that are not from God. God doesn't will evil things in our life. And yet we can find God's will in them when we're looking for purpose. I agree. The idea that God sends evil to me so I can learn something from it is we want to stay away from that. That's not what's happening. We want to instead appreciate that, look, things happen. God does allow them to happen, yet there's still something to be had, to be recovered from that situation. There's something, some way that we're being called forward. I really like that language you used, Karen. There's an area where we're being called on. Yeah. And that's that's the purpose that we're looking for. Yeah. The, the kind of the story that came to me about this is the figure of Joseph in the Old Testament. And just all the things that happened to him, you know, his brothers sticking him in the well and then selling him into slavery and then all the stuff that's happening with Pharaoh's wife. If you're asking, well, what's the reason? Well, you could come up with a lot of stuff, right? Well, yeah, you know, Joseph's father, he just he he just was playing favorites and so it's his fault that the brothers acted that way. And the brothers, man, they were just bitter and jealous and evil. And that's the reason that this happened to Joseph. Or Joseph was too full of himself, yeah. too young and naive and yes. prideful and yeah. set himself up for it. Oh, it's all my fault. Yeah. Or the reason is that Pharaoh's wife was a really terrible person and out for, you know, getting back at Joseph. And the leaders in Egypt were completely unfair and didn't care about 
you know, human rights and people. So you can look for lots of reasons like that. But Joseph had to keep looking for the purpose. He had to keep reaching into his situation and responding with the right kind of energy and and also allowing himself to be changed so that he could step into the purpose when it arose for him. That's really powerful, Karen. And it reminds me of what Jordan Peterson says about Alexander Solzhenitsyn. What's that? So he says, here's a man that was an intellectual. He was thrown into the gulag for kind of intellectual violations of government policies and rules. He's thrown and he's treated cruelly. He's watching people die around him. He has a dread sickness. And in all of this, as he's in the system, he asks himself, what did I do that brought me here? What is the area where I'm being called on? And what he came up with was, I didn't tell the truth. I cooperated in the lie. I let the, the government carry on with all of its, its untruths. And I was part of creating this, this big system that ultimately turned on me and put me here. Interesting. So you could ask that question looking for reasons, but he asked it looking for purpose. Looking for purpose. And he found the area where he was called on, where he was called forward. Hmm. Wow. That's really inspiring and convicting for me. Yeah. Well, that's pretty extreme. Pretty amazing. Yeah. So Curtis, what's our third dichotomy we want to talk about here? It's control. It's about having control. And when you don't want to have control or what you want to focus on. So really it's about our desire to want to have this control versus simply desiring to show up with the energy that's going to influence us and lead ourselves and other people to influence, to step forward in the situation in a way that's going to make a difference because the desire for control, it can simply frustrate us. And often we're operating under the illusion of control as we try to be responsible for things that really we're not responsible for and that are outside of our control. I wonder if it gets back to what we said at the beginning here, Curtis, that yes, we have plans, we have hopes, we have outcomes we're shooting for, and we have to hold them loosely. And I think like what you said, just that phrase, illusion of control, we can really think that we have more control over the events in our own lives and the ones that we love than we actually do. Sometimes we try to say, well, I I know I don't have control. I just need to turn over control and release control and that's not unhelpful. I just wonder if it's not if it's not even the right framework. Right. So instead of thinking about control, it goes back to thinking about our process and what what it is we can do and what it is we can influence. Yeah. So not so much how can I control this or how can I not control this, but how can I show up with my best self, with all of my best energy? Because actually when that happens... I find we have more influence than we believe. Influence over ourselves and others. Yeah. This makes me think of a lot of these adult children situations. Yeah. Where we really don't have control, but we can use our parental kind of guilt, I guess, to bend them to our will, but it it ultimately backfires on us and or we can think that they should be doing X, Y, Z, but really we can't make them do that. And instead of trying to get them to do things to get the outcome we want, focusing on our own attitude, our own outlook, and our own positivity that we're bringing to that relationship 
that makes a big difference. Sure. So it's almost connected with engaging with the process of the relationship and the growth of the young adult and showing up the way we want to show up to support and influence, but in a very positive way. We do have a season on relating to your young adult children. That's one of our most popular seasons. And you can look back in the episodes and find that one. This idea of control versus influence, Karen, it reminds me of meeting a certain politician in his offices oh, and talking to him yeah. and trying to explain a couple things to him. He was very naive about certain legislation that he was favoring. It was difficult not to point the finger, not to raise my voice. I think in retrospect, I don't think I expected really to change his mind. Yeah. But what was my expectation? And I, and I, and I think my focus should have stayed squarely on my presentation, my energy, my messaging, well, my building Curtis, you did the a relationship. Really good job. You did a good job with that. I was the one. <laughs> I was the one who did not bring the right energy to that conversation. So I feel like you you really did show up with, you know, holding the outcome loosely, but still your focus was how can I show up and make a difference? How can I speak truth regardless of the outcome? And I was the pointer. I was the finger pointer in that situation. <laughs> Karen's so embarrassed. That's like. But Thou I, shalt not wag thy finger. I was unhappy, yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, oh, well. You found the, the growth I in that. I found the learning yeah. in the process. So what do you think, Karen? What does that leave us? Well, I invite our listeners to just consider these dichotomies and how they show up in life and what it would be like to start to shift from focusing on outcomes to focusing on the process and the mastery potential to shift from looking for reasons to looking for purpose and finding the call before you and to shift from having a control focus to really focusing on showing up with the right energy and having your full influence. And maybe having a little trust. Yeah. A little trust in the process, a little trust in providence. Amen. And you, my friends, we would love for you to entrust your thoughts, opinions, and questions to us by, you could email us at thecatholicmidlife at gmail.com, thecatholicmidlife at gmail.com. Send us your impressions. We love to hear from you. And thanks for being here. We'll see you next week. Thanks for being here with us. The Catholic Midlife Podcast is for anyone that wants to receive the abundance of life that God has for each one of us. Take a moment right now to tell a friend about us.